Our next speaker was still a high school student in Salt Lake City 40 years ago when the John Birch Society was founded. A few years later, in 1964, he attended his first society meeting in the Utah Capitol. Transferred to Denver by his employer, he recontacted the society and joined in 1968. In 1972, he gave up a promising business career to accept the responsibilities of a coordinator, an assignment he filled for 13 years, and then was promoted to major coordinator, then to director of field activities. In 1991, he was asked to take the helm as the society's chief executive officer. He and his wife, Elaine, parents of a large family, reside in Menasha, Wisconsin, right next door to Appleton and our JBS headquarters. I've worked with this man since 1972. One of his first assignments as a coordinator was to meet me at the airport and take me around Colorado and sign up some people as advertisers in the magazine. We've been very good friends ever since. It's always been a pleasure to work with him. It's always been very productive for the society. He's all business, and we're very fortunate to have him at the desk where the buck stops here. I'm a great admirer of his ability and his no-nonsense determination to get the job done. So it's always a pleasure and another pleasure this evening to introduce him. Ladies and gentlemen, our Chief Executive Officer, G. Vance Smith. Thanks. Thank you very much. I guess it was Benjamin Franklin when he was talking about the Constitution and his hopes that it would endure, said, but nothing is certain but death and taxes. Some years later, Will Rogers said the same thing, nothing is certain but death and taxes. The difference is that death doesn't get worse every time Congress meets. <laughs> well, there are things that you can count on. There are things that are consistent. Gary Benoit used a, a French quote, uh, the English version in a bulletin last December, and, and you've seen it used over the years. The quote by Alphonse Carr is that the more things change, the more they stay the same. And isn't it true that the more things change, the more they stay the same? Robert Welch started the John Birch Society in 1958. There were thousands, I understand, uh, organizations that were freedom-loving patriots meeting with various agendas and going various directions. And Mr. Welch knew that little could be accomplished that way and that that group and other Americans needed leadership. And he put himself up reluctantly, but put himself forward and offered his personal dynamic leadership in the freedom fight and offered those people membership in the John Birch Society. The organization was based upon principles because he wanted the organization to last, as he would say, for hundreds of years. And as the organization was established, so it became clear that freedom itself is predicated upon principles that there are consistencies, and that the same is true, actually, for the enemy of freedom, who will use the same methods over and over again, and history is replete with those examples, that there really is nothing new under the sun, and that there, are, there really are not that many differences, and that things do stay the same. Well, we've noticed, as we have had the opportunity in recent years to offer leadership, that we face some of the same challenges that Mr. Welch did. 
Has Mr. Welch offered that leadership to what he called rugged individualists? They were people that came in that all had their own ideas of how things should be done, and he knew that. But he had thought long and hard before establishing the organization that would build the body of men and women that could make the difference. Nevertheless, he had to deal with people, and some of them could get pretty testy, as they would offer their counsel. Listen to a few paragraphs, lines from a letter written to Robert Welch in 1961. Now think of that. 1961, a member of the council, a member of the executive committee, and he said to Mr. Welch, all of this conversation boils down to what Histan says. Now, you old-timers know who Histan was, don't you? Congressman from California at the time who was a member of the John Birch Society. Quote, If the John Birch Society is to be saved, we must have a new face, unquote. And the John Birch Society must be saved if we are to save the country. I need not tell you that. I see it here in my town. Nobody who is anybody will join the John Birch Society. At the last executive meeting, I tried to tell you that the pressure is on for big defections and critical denunciations. I'm sorry to say this, Bob, but the society cannot play this vital role unless and until you gracefully retire into the editorial room, into the management of the, public, of the publication enterprise, which you have well and so wisely developed and find a new front man, but fast. <laughs> a new face can be found once you agree that a new face is needed. We are not looking for someone to take over in case of your death or disability. We need someone to take the front now with an appropriate, dignified explanation by the council there is no person on the executive committee or, to my knowledge, on the council who would or could fill this assignment, but such a man can and must be found outside. Now, how's that for a revelation? <laughs> Mr. Welch, really, in the third year, as the Birch Society was just growing and as it was taking off, there were those who had decided that he should step aside. Now, we had his leadership for 25 years, and because of that 25 years, he dealt with so many issues, issues having to do with the fight for freedom and issues in terms of establishing an organization that that 25 years is absolutely invaluable to this whole freedom fight. And yet someone early on said, step aside. I had a privilege of seeing Mr. Welch every year. We had in Colorado Springs, as I was a coordinator, we had a Rocky Mountain Rally, 4th of July Rocky Mountain Rally for the John Burt Society. It was a grand event. Mr. Welch would always be there and other top speakers. One year we had 1,500 people there for the weekend. It was a great occasion. And I'll not forget one time, as the activities finished on a Saturday night, Sunday, Loretta Quinn, who was the hostess of the event, had several of us over to her home for a reception. Late in the afternoon, I was asked to drive Mr. Welch back to the hotel. Honored to do so, and chatting with him about very, uh, various issues, we got caught up in conversation and I drove to the front of the hotel as anyone would and as I stopped Mr. Welch realized where I was and he said oh goodness Vance you have to take me around to the side of the hotel I said okay <laughs> so I drove past the front over to the side of the hotel feeling that I needed an explanation he said you have to understand that inside that hotel lobby are at least a dozen wonderful members of the John Birch Society 
who know how to run the Birch Society better than me. And they're just waiting there for me. And I love them dearly, but I'm too tired after that long weekend. I'm too tired. And so as we drove around, he again lamented more, to paraphrase that conversation, that he understood their frustration because he had helped them understand the great urgency of the battle, that it was real, that the great freedom, prosperity, the great American heritage was hanging in the balance. And they were looking at every turn to find something to help to ensure success. That's always been the case. There are those, and we're grateful for them. But we also have to make decisions and, and move forward. I've had the privilege with our present leadership team to be involved now for nearly seven years. And I want you to know that even though it gets a little challenging, it's a great honor and a great privilege to work with the people we have on the staff, on our council, out in the field, you, the volunteer chapter leaders and members. It's a wonderful experience. Every other month, in other words, once every two months, we invite the members of the staff who are really part of our writing and the leadership team, not the field, but we invite for uh, Jack, Jack McManus, Don Fotheringham, Bill Jasper, come into the office for a little over a week. They spend with us every two months. While they're in the office, we will hold various meetings. I wish you could attend some of those. We have one meeting called an Issues Committee. Some of these fellows are very, very involved in research and study. These men don't, they've never heard of a 40-hour week. Their weeks go 80 and 90 hours as they're working. And as they study, as Bill Jasper has pointed out, in doing so and looking in these various places, we can actually see what the insiders are doing as they telegraph their plans in the various meetings, the various activities and functions that they're involved in. We were involved one day in a, in a meeting with this group, and I think on that particular day, we had uh, tapped the services on the telephone of Larry Waters, veteran staff man in the field. And so around that table, and on the telephone, as the meeting was going on, I, I added up the years. In that meeting, and I'll read you the names. Jack McManus, Tom Gow, Gary Benoit, our new American editor, Bill Jasper, Jim Toff, Don Fotheringham, Will Grigg, Tom Edlam, the director of our research, and again, Larry on the phone. I added 210 years of field office staff service in that group. Over 200 years of employment and being involved in the trenches and in the thick of it as staff members. We don't have Robert Welch. We wish we did. By the way, next year, 1999, we'll recognize the 100th anniversary of Mr. Welch's birth. But we don't have Mr. Welch. But what we do have is the heritage and the legacy. And we have the disciples, the people that have picked up as he would have wanted them to where he left up. And some people with a great deal of moxie and commitment and some of some very powerful intellect. It's a great privilege to be a part of that and to just feel the commitment and the energy and the dedication to the John Burt Society and to the principles of freedom in working with those people. Ten of our, ten of our people on our staff have over 20 years 
and four of them over 30 years. I want to brag a little bit more by saying that there's real dedication. None of our people have gotten rich working for the John Birch Society. In fact, there is no retirement program. We haven't even advanced so far as a 401k. These men with 20, 25, and 30 plus years, they're not looking at a pension or a retirement plan. But they gave that up when they left their careers, when they came on the staff, oh, those many years ago, not knowing how many years of service that they would need to stay in the trenches. I'd like to comment as to the wonderful strength and commitment we have in our field of coordinators and major coordinators. Again, what a, what a challenging job as these men come on board knowing that they will spend often more time away from home than at home. Some of our men will spend only one week in a zone in which they live, and the other three and a half weeks of the month in motel rooms working the various parts of their age. A doctor who joined the John Birch Society here in California 30 years ago left his practice to be our coordinator in, in Virginia, in Washington, D.C. area three or four years ago. And there are many, many more stories of dedication and commitment to these people who are on our staff. It's wonderful to work with. We're growing. We're expanding the staff. We want you to know that. In 1997, 1998, we've added eight men to our staff. They are not all new territories. We had to replace some who had lost their jobs, quit their jobs. Some people who had taken the job of coordinator and found out that they weren't cut out for it. But we had growth, nevertheless, of coordinators. Now in two weeks, on the Monday the 27th, five more men will join our staff as coordinators, two of them here in California. I said we would end at 10, so I'll stop. But in doing so, I, I again want to thank you. I want to thank all of you. We know the seriousness of the battle. We know we're not going to save our country until sufficient numbers of Americans understand what's going on. They have to first understand the, the principles of freedom and the principles of the Constitution and what we have to do to preserve it. They've got to know that. And there are no organizational, educational organizations that are going to offer that, except the John Birch Society that I'm aware of. They've got to understand that there is a conspiracy working to destroy their freedoms, that there are those that have been determined for generations to have this entire planet enslaved under a one-world government. We've got to wake them, as we were committed, some of you, some of us, who came in in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, the challenge is there still. Our work is not done. Our neighbors, our friends, our brothers, our sisters, our children, our grandchildren, if they're with us, I guess we're finished. But if we still have some of those relatives, neighbors, and friends that are not members of the John Birch Society and actively involved in this fight, then we still still have a great deal to do. Let's do it. Let's do, as Mr. Welch said, be certain that we have less government, more responsibility, and with God's help, a better world. Thank you.